All righty. Uh, welcome back. We're joined by Odyssey MLB insider Brett Boone. Insider calls presented by Granger with supplies and solutions for every industry. Granger has the right product for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Brett is also the host of the Brett Boone podcast, featuring the most notable names in Major League Baseball and around sports every week. Brett, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. You got it, guys. Well, let me let me just start with yesterday's game between the Phillies and the Giants. Giants pitcher Kyle uh, Kyle Harrison came you know came inside to Brett Harper, uh, Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper said something, and then he came inside again. What what was your let's say interpretation of what what happened? Much ado about nothing, or was there something there? I th- I think it's much ado about nothing. However, you know, it, I'm I'm always really careful to comment on situations when they happen on the field. Cause we don't know a lot of times and, and you only know when you're a player, you know, part of that 26 man roster, there's always a backstory usually. And we never know. And it, right. could, it could come from a year ago. It could come from a B game in spring training in 2022. So you never just know. The only thing I can look at Harper seems to be pretty, be a pretty stand up guy. And today I was I was looking through and, and scrolling through and, and I saw his reaction to it. I think it was in the heat of the mm-hmm. moment. He's gotten hit he's gotten hit before. It's frustrating. It's scary when a ball comes that close to your head, you know. Um so I, I understand his frustration in the moment. I think he had time to think about it, sleep on it, woke up this morning and no you know what, there was no intent behind it. It just got away, and and man, I don't want to get hit in the face again. Because yeah. when what when you get hit in the face, it's it, it's a different it's a different animal. So I don't think there was anything to it, really. Brett, I, that's where I want to pick up. I was telling my partner I quit playing or trying to be a pro baseball player because of my fear of getting hit in the face. But I got to tell you, Brett, this year that extended part of the helmet that you know covers the chin. I've seen a couple guys have that almost save them. So Bryce has been hit in the face. He's been hitting the digits and missed time. Do you think baseball hitters get enough uh, credit for that gladiator aspect of sitting in the box with the ball coming 95 and 100? Well, you know, I, I just – I never thought about it that way because it's, it's all I ever did. Mm. And I never thought twice about getting hit ever. You know, now you, you mm. talk to a football player. And I think about coming across the middle on a slant pattern and just getting squared up by that line. I couldn't imagine it getting in the ring with a heavyweight champion and getting hit in the face. That scares me. But you, but Nolan Ryan or, or Randy Johnson hitting me in the head. Uh, it's the last thing on earth I'm worried about until it's there. I'll tell you when it's coming at your head and you're throwing 95, 98 miles an hour. My experience has been, yeah, and I've been hit in the head probably eight or 10 times. Never did it hurt, but it, it scares the daylight mm. out of you. And it's usually, a, it's usually a glancing blow, but it's nothing that, that I ever had any fear of, you know, I, I never had any fear of getting hit, but those other scenarios I, I pointed out, man, it's probably because I didn't do that for a living. And I, and it's not everything I knew since I was a young kid, but to think about it at, at the highest level, like I said, going across the middle in the NFL and just getting squared up, that scares me, but getting hit in the head, it's no big deal. <laughs> Brett Boone joining us on 95-7 The Game. He's an Odyssey MLB uh, insider. Can I assume you have no problem with with Kyle Harrison saying if he needed to go inside a third time that he that he would have, but he didn't feel like he needed to at that moment? I love it. I love it, uh, especially when you're my teammate. I mean, you got to be able to go in there. We're not, we're not in the business. We're not here to hurt anybody. But we're here to move your feet, especially when you're a great player. And the guys that I respected the most when I was hitting were the guys that would come in high and tight. Maybe we, we'd exchange a glance, like, hey, don't be doing it. And then they come right back in there. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, man, this guy's got some, uh, how do we put it? He's got some stones, and he's not going to be back to back the way. The guys that were great for me as a hitter is when I, maybe I maybe I got hit by a pitch. And as a hitter, you have a pretty good idea if you're getting thrown out on purpose or maybe a two-seamer gets away from you and comes inside and glances you. Now, as a hitter, what I tried to do in my day when I got hit is really go into that mode of, man, I'm hurt, I'm on the ground, I'm rolling around, and, and kind of peeking under my helmet, looking at the pitcher, see how he's affected by this. If I've got his, his empathy, if I've got his sympathy, like he didn't really want to hit me, and he feels bad, I go to first. I got him set up 
for the rest of that game. Because the last thing he wants to do is come inside and hit me again. I just eliminated a pitch. I eliminated right. fastball in. Now I can hang out over that play and get what I'm thinking. The guys that would come inside hit me, and then my next at bat go right to that two si- two seamer back inside. Now, from a strategic standpoint, man, I don't know what to do now because this guy's not scared to come back inside. He's not scared to hit me. I don't think he's hitting me on purpose. But those are the guys that I, that I don't want as a teammate. Those guys that would hit somebody on accident come right back inside that next at bat. Those are the guys I, I, I want to go to battle with. Brett, speaking of battle, your brother Aaron is bringing his Yankees to town. They're in town, but they got uh, a weekend set with the Giants. Bob Melvin Brett. has the Giants playing good baseball right now. The fans are excited. Yeah, I but I want to talk about expectations as much as you can share with um, us the pressure for your brother Aaron to be the Yankees manager where it's almost, it feels like Brett, you know, in, in my shoes, the Yankees it's championship or bust. Do you guys talk about that pressure or is that something that he, he just knows how to deal with? Speak to us about that. Without a doubt. I mean, you know what you signed up for when you, when you signed on the dotted line to be the skipper of the Yankees. I mean, you're going to be held at a different level. And, and I think, yeah, of course it's unfair, but if you don't, I told Aaron, you know, when, when he re-signed and, and they signed an extension, I said, where the hell else would you want to do it? Do it and do it on the hottest burner possible. Cause if you win, if you ever win in that city, you're going to have the key to the city for the rest of your life. I said, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else except around the hot seat. Yeah. You get criticized all the time. And it, 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 a lot of it's just nonsense. I mean, I, I laugh this year cause they're off to a great start. Everybody's healthy. And I was doing an interview the other day. They asked me, I said, well, I had an off-season camp, and I invited my brother, and I taught him how to be a really good manager. <laughs> and look look what he's doing, you know. I, I, for the people a year ago when everybody was hurt, and the roster's decimated by injury, and they're not living up to expectation. Every day Aaron Boone stinks. They want to, you know, they want him executed in, in the town square. And a year later, they're rolling. And, and now I say, well, did he just learn how to manage overnight? It just shows you how much it really is on the players. As players, uh, very rarely did I come back from a game, sit around with my teammates and say, man, the manager really screwed us today. The wins and losses are on us. We play the game. Once the national anthem ends, uh, there's only so much, there's so much, only so much input you have as a manager. I think the real manager work is behind the scenes, preparing your team, getting the guys in, and creating an atmosphere for each individual to be as good as they can. So, yeah, we discussed the pressure. It is what it is. He, he, he's, he's gotten a good, uh, you know, he's got a good sample size now of what it's like to, to manage in New York, good times and bad times. Think about this New York team. They're dangerous right now. They were just down in San Diego. I live in the San Diego area. I went out to a Padre game, and the Yankees are playing really good. They're hitting on all cylinders. You've got Judge and Soto. Uh, that pitching staff's been unbelievable. I didn't think they were going to be able to hold up like they have with with their ace, Garrett Cole, the Cy Young Award winner a year ago, being out so long. But they've really pitched well. That bullpen is a power bullpen, and everybody's healthy. They just got D.J. LeMahieu, that last piece. Vertigo came over from the in the offseason. Obviously, the Juan Soto's been a huge boon to that offense. But the key for me, for that Yankee offense, is Giancarlo Stanton. He's not the, the MVP candidate like a judge or a Soto, but his sheer presence in the middle of that lineup, and he's hitting home runs again, is making them just as good as they can be. Yankees are tough right now. Giants are playing great baseball, 7-3 uh, and three their last 10, 10-3 ten and three in their last 13. Uh, there's something magical about that city of San Francisco. You guys won World Series in 10, 12, and 14. And I looked at those teams and I thought, are they the greatest team of all time? No, but they won World Series. Mm. I think there's something special about Oracle Ballpark. Mm. No hitters like to go there and play. The weather's tough. It's a big yard, especially to right field. So uh, I don't know. It'll be a good series. I'm glad to see the Giants playing well because I looked at this team on paper before the season started. And the way you guys start off, I said, the Giants are a better team than that. Key is you got to get Snell back cooking and, and being that guy he was a year ago. And I, and I think a large portion of your success this year is going to be built on that starting rotation. Yeah. And, and they've got to pitch really good. That offense to me, I look up and down, nothing, nothing stands out. I look at that Giants team, nothing exciting. A bunch of players that are good players, but nothing that they don't have the star power that the other teams do. They've got to use their facility, the home field advantage of Oracle Park, which I think as a, 
you know, I played for a long time and I played in a lot of ballparks. San Francisco is one of the toughest places to play, and I think they need to use that to their advantage. Insider calls are brought to you by Granger. You're listening to Brett Boone. For the ones who get it done, Granger offers professional grade supplies and solutions made for every industry and backed by product experts. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Uh, speaking of the players, uh, the, the Giants have a young shortstop, Marco Luciano, who's really uh, been struggling in the field. He's made a five errors in, in, since he's come up, and a couple of them have been in the ninth inning, three of them as a matter of fact. And the Giants obviously are, are they consider themselves a playoff contender. What do, you, what do you do with a young player? How long do you stick with him if he's a shortstop and he's not fielding the ball well at all? I'll tell you, the difference in today's game, 2024, that has been in past years, and let's say, let's go back six, seven, eight years. The minor league players today, when, when I was coming up, and I came up in 1992, I never played a game outside of second base. I was a second baseman. I was drafted. You know, we were all shortstops in college, but I, I was a second baseman from day one in instructional ball. And I never played a game outside of second base. Shortstops are shortstops. You're born a shortstop. And, and the great ones, uh, if you can play short, you can play anywhere on the field. But if you can't play short, it's the only position you really can't hide someone at. I see today's game and how it's changed is we take these middle infielders and in the minor leagues, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think the players today are as athletic as they've ever been, more so. Uh, but you're, you play a lot of second base, you play shortstop, you play third base, and you go around that lever in the minor leagues. So you're, you're efficient at all three positions. But the true, true shortstops, they're born that way. And, and you don't make anybody into a shortstop. The fact that Mookie Betts has been able to do it at the big league level, if he can do it all year and, and be comparable defensively, that'll be one of the greatest things I've ever seen in, in baseball. Because I know what it's like to play mm. short. I played short in college. I got drafted as a shortstop. As soon as I got to minor league camp to put me at second, I kind of just rolled my eyes and said, you're right, I'm glad you put me there because I can't play big league shortstop on a daily basis. It's the hardest position. It's the only position you can't hide someone at. So he's going to have to get through that and doing it at the big league level at that position. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb if you can't handle that defensively. If you're a left fielder, a second baseman, you can kind of get away with it third in the outfield, especially, but shortstop, it's going to be made known. And, and the problem is it's the most demanding position. It's the most skilled position. And it's the most, it's the position where most of the balls get hit to. So you're going to be, you're going to be put on stage and that bright light's going to be on you every night. It'll be interesting to see if he can work through this defensively. Yeah. I can't wait, Brett. I got to tell you, I got a brother and I was just thinking right now I had the thought, you know what? Let me ask Brett. Can he, does he have a funny story? about the manager, his brother, coming in that'll be overseeing the Yankees for this weekend that he can share with Giant fans? Oh, Aaron Boone, where, where do I begin? <laughs> you know, we, 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 we had such a, a cool childhood. He's four years my junior. And Aaron was that guy, you know, growing up that, that my buddies that were my age, you know, it wasn't really cool back then if you're 12 to be hanging out with an eight-year-old kid. But for some reason, Aaron had that, he had that special factor that my buddies, you know, the, our seventh graders, we'd let a we'd let a third grader tag along with us and, and play, you know, all the games we played back then, uh, street uh, t touch football. The, we'd get the street hockey nets at. When the cars came, we had to move the nets, and Aaron was always invited. And if the game got a little too physical for him where the guys were older, uh, Aaron would sit on the side of the road, and he would, he would announce the game. He was Harry Callis. <laughs> well, we'd go in and we'd be playing dunk ball in a garage, and if the kids were too physical for him, he'd sit there and announce, and he'd pretend like he was the 76ers announcer. I grew up in Jersey, so Philly was the theme to everything. But he was just a good kid, fun, tagged along. I had that squeaky voice, but my buddies were, I, you know, you don't always want your little brother tagging along with you, but my buddies were like, let Eric come along. We want to hear him do the play-by-play -play in this wiffle ball game we're about to have today. So. The stories are endless. We fight, we fight like brothers, but in a really good, respectful way. Uh, we have a lot of similarities. We, we both uh, argue the game on both sides. He's a little more technical than me and gets into the data points, and I try to counter his data points. But we have a healthy relationship. For the most part, we see eye-to-eye -eye on, on the game of baseball and the ins and outs and the inner workings of it. He's just a little more 
farther along and, and buys a little more into the data and how heavy it is in today's game than I do. But more, more or less, our talks, we talk on a weekly basis, and, and more times than not, it's about family and about how the kid's doing. You know, how are my, mm. how are my nieces and nephew and, and Aaron's wife? And once in a while, he'll call me and go, what do you think about, you know, this reliever we brought up to have you watched in the last two or three games? I'm thinking about doing this. I'll give him my input. Sometimes he listens. Sometimes he doesn't. But uh, he's a good man. He's doing a good job, and, and, and I'm proud of him. I mean, nice. I love it. I love it. <laughs> a, a Harry Callis reference, and then uh, oh, also no. referencing also referencing Dave Zinkoff, the uh, great Philadelphia uh, PA announcer. So yeah. I, I'm from uh, Reading, so I know I saw your dad play with the Phillies and remember. Yeah, uh, I remember. I lived. I think I was in Reading. I, well, I was w- right one. <laughs> yeah, they got a they have a double A team in Reading, but I I'll never forget when uh, your dad had that foul ball and it popped out of his glove and Pete Rose was was there to save the day. Never forget. And you it. know what he says? He, he says uh, he says that. Pete, Charlie hustle my ass. That's what my dad said. That was, he said that that was Pete's ball the whole way. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you so Take much for joining us, uh, Brett. Really appreciate it, and uh, have a great weekend. You got it, guys. Thank you.